all the land. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Thank you all for showing up. And I actually heard from a few people who said that they were joining on live stream. So, hi, Sue. Hi, Marie. Um, thank goodness we have this to, you know, broadcast wherever. That doesn't put any pressure on anybody. Um, so I'm used to um, most often being here at the beginning of the service and welcoming our speaker. And it's really an honor to be able to stand up here in front of you and share a message. Um, and, you know, I know sometimes Brenda would come up and say, gosh, this lesson could be like a month series. And as I was diving into this lesson, I really um, came to believe that. Um, this is something that I've been working through for um, quite some time. And it's really an important um, subject to me. You know, when I was a child, um, I was really jealous of the talents of other people because I really felt like I didn't have any talent. I really felt unworthy by, in comparison to all of my peers and seeing you know, the artists and the athletes and the dancers and the speakers and the popular and the pretty. And yeah, I even thought pretty was a talent. <laughs> it, you know, so before we're even born, you know, our parents imagine what we will be, who we will be. Um, I remember feeling that way about my children and feeling that way about um, my grandchildren as well. <laughs> um, after we are born, our family watches us grow and they start attributing attributes to our children as they emerge and say, who will they become? Then as a teenager and a young adult, we start um, wondering, who am I? And how am I special? And maybe explore different activities and different things to kind of see, you know, what interests fit me um, and what don't. And as a young adult, we find that we're trying to prove ourselves into um, a world of, of work and a career and try to convince people that we have strengths and talents and find ways that we can express that through a career or a job. Then, when we get to middle age, like me, um, and on the other side of that, <laughs> we begin to wonder, um, you know, what do we want to accomplish with the second half of our life? Really, you know, have I, have I even begun to fulfill my purpose in life? And then, in later life, I've been told um, that we reflect back and we say, um, uh, wondering what people will say uh, when we're gone. How will we be remembered? Kind of reflecting, what have I accomplished in my life? So many of these ideas are actually imposed by our societal norms, by our culture, expectations of achievement, really our need to feel like we have to prove our worth. And through this, we tend to forget the truth, the truth of our being that we are of love, we are God, we are perfect as we are. When did we forget that? Deepak Chopra from the earliest of age asked his children not to worry about all of this. Instead, he asked them to think about how they were going to serve humanity by understanding their unique talents. Can you imagine having Deepak Chopra as a dad? <laughs> Pretty cool. He wrote a cool book that I'm, going to reference, that I'm going to reference later, but he also wrote a companion book um, using these same spiritual laws um, about guiding your children to success and, and fulfillment. And I'll just read this. As a child with spiritual skills, we will be able to answer the most basic questions about how the universe works. She will understand the source of creativity both within and outside herself. She will be able to practice non-judgment, acceptance, and truth, and be free from the crippling fear and anxiety about the meaning of life that is a secret dry rot inside the hearts of most adults, whether they can admit it or not. 
The deepest nurturing you can give your child is spiritual nurturing. Well, I'm not sure how well I did with that. I think we all try as parents to do the best we can. Um, but perhaps my own struggle as a child helped me to understand my son when he, uh, when I saw how he constantly compared himself to his uh, to other kids, and he really deemed himself as less than. It was pretty painful to see that as a. Ch can you turn that up a little bit? My mom can't hear me. <laughs> got Mom's got to hear. Just just saying. Mom's got to hear. Okay. I'll just keep it nice and close here. I'll eat the microphone. Um, so anyway, my son uh, would really compare himself all the time in sports and school and math and reading, whatever. It didn't matter what the subject was. He was constantly comparing himself. And he really believed that he was less than. And then as a teenager, his feelings of unworthiness really deepened inside of him as he struggled with the idea and the thing that he told himself that he did not have any talent. It's painful to watch that as a parent. And I struggled to really know how to release him of that burden and that judgment, that self-judgment. And I remember telling him, you know, high school is just this little picture of life. It has limited opportunities of experience. And as you grow into adulthood, you will find different opportunities to, um, to really learn who you are, learn what your talents are. And through that, I just said, just remember that you are a child of God. You are love. And the sooner you can recognize that, the sooner you can be free to explore what your talents are. So it made me question, what is holding us back from doing that? Unworthiness, fear. I will never forget the moment that I shared with him the quote from Marianne Williamson's book. Um, it's not a very pretty book because the cover is off, but it's um, A Return to Love. And I think this is a quote that many of you actually know. So I, I read the quote to him, and he, the next day, I knew it struck a chord when he came back and he said, um, can you repeat that to me? And he actually wrote it down, and he stuck it on the refrigerator. And he said, and the quote goes, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. So I think most of us know that part of the quote, but the rest of the quote is just as powerful and really feeds into the rest of our talk today. So we ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. We were born to make, man uh, it is not just in some of us, it's in every one of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. We are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. Pretty powerful stuff. So throughout our lives, we may search for our purpose. There have been so many books written. I, I brought three that I used for this talk, but as I looked on my shelves, I thought, wow, I have a lot of books on purpose, um, a purpose-driven life, and one was discover my true north, your true north. And I think um, many of us spend time thinking about our purpose. Have any of you kind of taken a look at that and wondered, what is, what is my purpose in life? Anybody? See a few nods. Um, so the experience with my son kind of caused me to ponder that question and to wonder when and how did I begin to know what my purpose was. And I'm not sure that I really figured it out very easily. I think it just kind of emerged as I kind of went through life. And then I began to understand that it was really when I started 
I, I felt when I felt most alive and when I was experiencing joy that I must be expressing my true purpose. I talked, uh, listened to Laura two weeks ago when she was talking about joy, and she said, uh, joy is where your treasure is. What is your treasure if not your gifts? We experience joy when we give of our gifts. So what if our true purpose is to be an expression of Christ, to be spirit expressing, expressing the one light we're all meant to be? familiar from the lyrics in our song. So rather than um, looking within and um, questioning whether or not we have any worth or purpose, let's just already start from the premise and the knowing that we are here to express God on earth. In the seven spiritual laws of success, Deepak Chopra shares the seventh and final law, the law of Dharma, or purpose in life. The law of Dharma says we have taken manifestation in the human physical form to fulfill a purpose, pure potentiality. We each have a unique way of expressing it, and for every unique, ex uh, unique expression of that talent, there is also a unique need that needs to be met. So expressing your talent to fulfill needs creates unlimited wealth and abundance. So that's really, we're talking about the law of Dharma. And there are three laws, or three components to that law. One is that we are here to discover our purpose, our true self, to find out on our own that our true self is spiritual, that we're here to discover our higher self or our spiritual self. We must find it out for ourselves that we were born so that we can express our divinity. Do you believe that? Do you believe that we are here to express our divinity? I think that's why a lot of us come here to unity. So to really get to that place, I think it takes um, some shifting of our internal dialogue. Um, being able to say to ourselves, I am going to seek my higher self. It's beyond my ego. And I'm going to do that through spiritual practice, which is why we come here to learn our tools, to put our spiritual tools into practice. So the second law of Dharma, or the second component of the law of Dharma is to express our unique talents. So um, we, all, we may have the same talent, but it's our unique expression of that talent that is, that is different. And how do you know when you're in that? Well, you lose track of time. When you are expressing that unique talent, it takes you into timeless awareness. Uh, recently, a friend told me about his experience on a job, uh, with a job that was a job. Every day felt like a week, and he felt drained, and both physically and mentally by that experience every single day. No money, he said, was worth having the life sucked out of him every single day. Then he shared how when he is working on things that give him joy, the time just flies. I don't know if you've ever had a job that has sucked the life out of you, but that was probably a good experience in knowing what your true purpose and your unique talents are not. <laughs> um, at my work, we say we have this strengths-based culture. So we um, try to find and focus on ourselves and in each other our strengths. And we know that we have a stronger team when we recognize those strengths in each other. And um, so I have a philosophy, and that is if I go to work and I am spending the majority of my time doing the things that I know are, are my gifts, that are mine to give, and the least amount of time doing the things that feel like work, then I am going to be more fulfilled and more engaged in that mission. So we do take some time to make sure that we're looking at that. 
uh, the second um, law of Dharma that we talked about um, requires a shift in our dialogue as well. I am going to discover my unique talents and, an, and I enjoy myself because in that joy is a state of bliss. I think we all want to live in bliss. Um, I know throughout the years, as we've been as we've tried to think about how do we help people here at Unity discover their own spiritual gifts, and we've looked at different inventories, spiritual gifts inventories, and if you've ever um, at work, maybe you've done kind of a strengths assessment or a, um, a personality profile, trying to kind of get at what's what's special about me, who am I? Um, but I would really challenge us not to wait for an assessment to figure that out. Um, I think we figure it out through trial and error in life and really noticing when we really are expressing our heart's desire. So take a minute right now to just maybe close your eyes and think for a moment about, think about a time when you are expressing your gifts and talents, when you're really playing to your strengths. Do you notice that the time has flown by? Or maybe you feel free and unlimited in that expression. What feeling is in your heart when you're expressing that? Can you get a sense of God in that moment? Can you recognize your opportunity to express God through your unique gifts and talents in that moment and in other moments throughout your life? So, were you able to find that? Could you find that within yourself? Go ahead and open your eyes. It's kind of interesting how sometimes we aren't able to really fully see ourselves um, as we are, and that's why we're seeking out the, the reading and we're seeking out the, the surveys and the assessments that help us to understand who we are. <laughs> So back at work, um, we did um, the Strengths Finder. Have any of you done Strengths Finder? So there's like 35 different strengths that people have. And by taking this assessment, you um, discover your top five strengths. And what's really funny is that when we sit around and we share our top five strengths with each other, um, people will say, well, yeah, that's you. I, I see that in you. And you're like, really? That's cool. Um, and then um, it kind of makes me think about how what Jonas was saying last week when he said um, that when we focus on that positive aspect of ourselves and of each other, we um, that really reinforces that, right? Um, so he really referred to it as karma. And I really loved his definition of karma. It's when the energy we put out there comes back to us, right? So we get to decide what are we putting out there. Kind of the law of cause and effect, which is an unchanging law. But what is um, within our control is uh, what we see and what we look for in others and in ourselves. When I was on the Unity CR board, Jim, I think you were there at the time, maybe Barb was, um, we did this thing at the retreat where we had this big chart paper and everybody had their name on the chart paper, one for each person, and we all walked around and we wrote on that paper what we saw in that person, what strengths we felt like that person brought to the board. And then we 
each, when we were all done and we exhausted all of our ideas and filled our paper, we all went and stood by our paper. And one at a time, we read the words that were on the paper. Do you remember that, Jim? Were you there then? Barb remembers. Okay. It must have been after Jim. Okay. Um, so what happened in that moment when you actually had to read what other people thought about you and what people saw in you? It was very powerful and it was very emotional. Some of us had a really hard time reading those words. We ended up taking those papers and we plastered the boardroom with it. And so every time we came together for our meeting, it was basically staring us in the face. And we thought, wow, look at this. Look at what all we have in this room, all the gifts and the talents that we have and that we are affirming in each other each and every time we gather. Again, that was a really, really powerful thing. Because when we see the Christ light in others, we are experiencing karma. So the third component of Dharma is service to humanity. So to serve your fellow human beings, you ask yourself, how can I help all those that I come into contact with? When you co combine the ability to express your unique talent with service to humanity, then you make full use of Dharma, which is purpose for life. So think about that, how powerful that is. This is my gift. This is my gift to share. This is my gift to give to humanity, to give to another person. And then you also couple that with your own experience of spirituality. There's, when you think about those things in combination, you realize that you do have unlimited abundance in your life. So, again, asking ourselves, how can I help instead of what's in it for me? When you're saying, how can I help, you're speaking from spirit. And when you're saying, what's in it for me, you're speaking from ego. So really, it's about where you experience your universality. So we talk about that interconnectedness of all of us, right? And that's how we, in connection with one another, with one another. So how am I best suited to serve humanity? Um, we are studying this book, um, one chapter each month, uh, Do Greater Things, Following in Jesus' Footsteps. And we all know that Jesus dedicated his life to serving others, um, and um, he knew that to serve his brothers and sisters was to serve God. And in the book, it really talks about our sole purpose for our existence is to be happy. And our quickest way to happiness and joy is to freely share of our gifts, of our time, and of ourselves. Jesus knew this powerful secret uh, because he freely shared of himself his wisdom with those around him because he truly understood that all fulfillment comes from giving of oneself. You may remember the saying that Jesus said, whatever we do to the least of us, we also do to him. So when we freely give up our God-given talents, we serve the divine. Um, checking time, checking how many pages I've left. Um, the other cool thing is to think about, so what is my motivation to give? Is my motivation to give so that I can feel good about myself? Is it to get something in return? If we enter into a situation expecting that you're going to get some sort of praise and adoration for your giving, then you're probably entering into it with the wrong idea. It's really when we can go into it 
without any expectation of what comes out of it, without any expectation of what comes back to us. So we've been talking a lot about our gifts, and sometimes we think, well, it's that one special thing. But I would say it's really not about that one special thing. It's really about how we show up in the world. And we know that through our unity work, right? It's not about um, doing this one miraculous thing that we help another person with. But it's really being present to another human being and being our authentic self. So it does not have to be dramatic to be meaningful. Service can come in all shapes and sizes. It can be as simple as having a conversation with somebody, to be fully present to them. It's important to remember that we don't need to judge our acts as small or big or worthy or unworthy, or some as less than honorable, because all service is worthy. We really all have an ability to contribute to our planet by showing up, being our authentic self, and remembering that no job is holier than another. And really, all of these works are vital to the whole. So, the other part that is about um, service is something that's been a little more challenging for me in my life. And that is being vulnerable by sharing our pain and our vulnerability. Sometimes we feel like we need to kind of keep our, our pain and our vulnerability hidden and secret because we really feel like, well, I don't think anybody else really wants to hear that. They really want to hear positive words and positive messages. Or maybe we don't share it because we are afraid of being rejected or judged. I know for me, that was definitely the case. Definitely felt um, a lot of fear around that, around sharing um, some of my pain. So, um, kind of diving deeper into my spiritual practice, I um, realized that when I well, actually, it wasn't until I shared it that I really realized that by sharing my, open, my pain and my challenges openly and honestly that I was really giving others a priceless gift. I was giving others the opportunity to serve me in my hurt and in my anxiety. And we also share and give people a gift when we share our mistakes. And I have an example of this as well. So we create room for others to kind of lay down um, their unreasonable expectations of themselves. You know, as a leader in a nonprofit organization, I'm like, oh, you have to be everything to everybody. Everybody has all these expectations of you. And um, with the program managers, so these are kind of the highest level of leaders within our organization, we started reading a book called Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. And so we were really talking about being vulnerable. And when we started sharing, we were talking about um, uh, one day I came into a meeting and I just said, I just have to tell you that I am just really in a bad place right now. And I'm not sure how I'm going to be in this moment. I'm not sure how I'm going to, going to be able to respond or contribute to this meeting. And they just all embraced me and said, thank you. And at that moment, I didn't realize how po powerful my vulnerability would be. Um, and it was weeks later when we were really diving into the book that they said, when you said that, it made me realize that it's okay. It's okay to be human. It's okay to share our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses and our challenges. So if we 
release the idea of giving service as a reward and instead give service out of love because we know that's our gift to give and that when we do that, we truly are spirit expressing. In that moment, we are expressing our and manifesting our pure potential. Really, that's God's promise for us. So last week, Jonas uh, talked about the I am. Remember, he said, when we become aware, we have a choice. He also said, be bold in the world in the most loving way. We have an opportunity to practice spiritual teaching through service. We don't have to be anybody. We don't have to prove who we are. We simply need to be our authentic self and recognize our true gifts and talents that are God-given. We have a daily, and I would say even hour by hour, opportunity to be of service in this world by sharing our gifts, by giving of our time, by being vulnerable, by admitting our mistakes, and by really deepening and strengthening your own spiritual practice. So I would like to end today by rereading the Marian Williamson quote. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. You are playing small and the world does not serve us. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our light, own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. So with that, we'll just go into just a moment or two of meditation. So I invite you to get even more comfortable in your chair and take a deep breath. As we take a moment to get centered, we tap in to that heart space. And we know that God is there. We know that God is in us and moves through us. Because after all, we are spirit expressing and that truly is our purpose in the world. We take this moment to give great thanks to all the people who have taken the time to listen and to be present to you in your time of fear sadness and anxiety and we recognize that that was their gift to give us in that moment and we seek other opportunities to allow others to give up their gifts And as we think about 
those beautiful moments when we truly are expressing our unique gifts and we are feeling the joy of God filling our spirit. We know that we truly are one of God, one with God. And so with that knowing, with that awareness, we give such great thanks and appreciation for that awareness. And we know that through our connection with other people here in our spiritual community and beyond the spiritual community, that we truly are living our light, shining our light onto the world and into the world. Recognizing that what we put out there comes back to us. What a blessing to know that and to anchor into that truth. So in this moment, as you're breathing in God, know that you have your own unique expression and way of shining your light into the world. Amen.